we have uh, an expression, an idiom that speaks to this condition of knowing something but not really processing it enough, not addressing it. And we call that an elephant in the room. We all are familiar with this expression, elephant in the room, I'm sure. Okay, there's been several elephants in the rooms in my life. Things that happen, uh, maybe a relative that has an issue that needs to be confronted, but no one ever confronts them. Out of what they think is love, but it's really selfishness and wanting, wanting approval. So years go by with this person, this elephant in the room, running around the house, tearing things up, and everyone acts like they don't notice it. There are other situations uh, where things may be going on right in front of our eyes. And every time I, I get up here, it's like a month has passed by since we have done this. And you look at what's going on in the political realm, and for so many people, they, they don't understand what's going on. But for some of us, it should be elephants in the room. We should know what's going on. The prophecy of Daniel 11, I've been thinking about that a lot. We don't hear about that much. And uh, I thought about Daniel 11 with this left-right paradigm and uh, the things that are going on. This battle that we're seeing is, is forcing God's people, as it were, into tribalism. Uh, we can't be into tribes right now, you know, the red or the blue. Uh, we have a mission, and I'm, that's one of the elephants in the room that I've already addressed. So I'm entitling every message that I'll be speaking on until God says something else. It's going to be entitled Elephant in the Room. We're going to deal with Elephant in the Room prophecy, uh, and particularly Daniel chapter 11. Are, 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 are any of us familiar with that prophecy? Daniel chapter 11, very serious problem, uh, prophecy and very pertinent to our times right now. It's being fulfilled in front of our very eyes. We need to be able to label who are the participants. Who is the king of the south? Who is the king of the north? What are the issues involved? How does the king of the north overcome the king of the south? And I'll give you a little preview. It's not like it's done in other circumstances where it's a military overtaking. It's more like a hostile takeover or a merger where the, the, the identifying characteristics of the king of the south, which is Egypt, which is godlessness or atheism, when we think that it's antithetical to the, the king of the north, who we might say is the right, really it's the papacy is the king of the north, and the papacy has drawn out this battle that's really, really not a battle at all. There's been a merger or an acquisition of the resources of Egypt or atheism, distrust in, in the Genesis, the first chapters of Genesis. Well, you would think that would be antithetical to the king of the north, but actually it's not. The, uh, the idea of social justice and how we need to have a violent overthrow of systems, convincing people that they are oppressed, and they need to violently overthrow the government that, that they're in. Now, I understand that you may be thinking of BLM, Black Lives Matter, things like this. These are people, I believe the masses of them, are people who are just trying to uh, address what they think is injustice. Should we all have a problem with injustice? Because our God surely does. But the issue is that it's not really about that. The issue that is going on in all these movements is that there is a hatred for order of any kind, whether it's patriarchy, whether it's God's order on anything, education, whatever it is, the devil is working through people to put these things up as false. He's attacking order, period. And it's God's order that he's uh, attacking. So one of the upcoming messages will be about that. So you should do a little homework and study Daniel chapter 11. Do some word searches and, and look at there, and, and, and you, you can see flattery is the way that this war is won. Pandering is another word for flattery. And you, you're seeing a lot of pandering going on. But is the, it, the enemy being in, on both sides, and people, he doesn't care which ditch you fall in, because everyone is going to be sucked into or absorbed into the kingdom of the north. Uh, we're going to look at that. I want you to do some preliminary work on that. Is that okay? All right, I don't know if that's, that probably needs to be the next message or the next study because uh, it's very pertinent to what we're dealing with right now. Uh, I think what we want to talk about today is just can we talk? This is just inter introductory. Can we talk? You know, all right. Thank you, Becky. We, we can talk. All right, we're in John chapter 13, 
And there were some elephants in the room. When we were in the upper room, there were some elephants there. Things that people should have known, but they just weren't addressing it. And I want us to know that Jesus sees our elephants. He sees them. And we're going to see this, uh, as this as we look at a few key verses in John chapter 13. We know that this is preceding or going, coming before the Last Supper. Jesus is in between two economies where the, 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 the feast is about to be replaced with an ordinance. For the feast of the lamb being slain and eaten with bitter herbs. He, want, he's going to, he has this, this feast with his disciples, but then he institutes another one. He institutes foot washing and the Lord's Supper. And so we're picking up in John 13 and verse 1. It says, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew, you see, and we want to tie this in with elephants in the room. Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Should the disciples have known the same thing? So this was an elephant in the room. For three and a half years, he had been telling them this, right? Been alluding to the fact. And before even Jesus showed up on the scene, they had this picture being presented in the Old Testament sanctuary through the sacrifices. We should know that Jesus has a limited time on earth. He said that the chief priests and scribes will take me and they're going to crucify me. They're going to kill me. But in the, on the third day, what will happen? I'll rise again. They should have known it. So that's an elephant that was in the room. But Jesus knew that his hour was come that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Here Jesus is again. He knows, right? Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and that he went. To God. That's very important that Jesus knew that. We're called to be humble disciples of Christ. And if you don't know where you come from, you don't know where you're going. If you don't know who you are in Christ, you're not able to do the work that God has called you to do. If we're going to be sensitive and, and, and picky and concerned about our reputations, we can't do this work. So Jesus is about to do something that is very lowly. He's taking on the role of a servant, something he's used to, according to Philippians 2. Even though he was in the very form of God, he chose to take on the position of what? A slave. And so he's doing this, but why is he able to do it? Because he knows something. He knows who he comes from. He knows where his identity is. He knows where he's going, and he understands where he fits in with God's plan. So he's able to do something that the disciples were not able to do. They were sitting around the table worrying about who would be the next in this kingdom. They were worried about who would be the conference who will be in the conference office, so to speak? Who will be this director or have this position or have this clout? That is what they were thinking about. Who would be the greatest among them? And they're about to take the ordinance of humility. Jesus knows how to bring a mirror before us and show us our elephants that are in our rooms. Verse 4, he rises from supper, and he laid aside his garment and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he pours water in a basin and begins to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherein with he was girded. This is the creator of the universe, stooping down, just like he stooped down to breathe breath into the nostrils of Adam. Here he is, breathing breath or some kind of situation that he's trying to breathe into the heart of the disciples, even Judas. He washed his feet. And then and Sister White says that, that joy thrilled through him for a time. But then it was beaten back down by the waves of selfishness and pride. And him seeing that the kingdom that was coming was not the kingdom that he had bargained for. So he's washing their feet. And Jesus, I remember having to tell this story uh, to children and, and losing it. And I'm trying not to lose it in front of you now. This is very emotional to me that Jesus would do this for us. And he's instituted this for us. It must be something about this that works on our hearts. That's why I would never, it's always up to you, but I would never try to offer the glorious drinking of the wine and the bread without humbling ourselves and doing this first. It's just something that I will never recommend. But the choice is up to, to you. The choice is up to each one of us. It would be like eating without washing your hands. 
we're eating without being cleansed first. We want to be cleansed before we eat. Cleansed from selfishness. And Jesus, in his wisdom, instituted that, that when we do this, that we will be departing from the selfishness of self-trust or whatever we would have, and we'll be looking to God and to his kingdom. It took me a while to participate in this when I first joined the church, and I was not excited about washing another man's feet. I was not waiting with bated breath to, to begin this service. And I was looking for a way out, and one of the men said, oh, may I serve you? It was too late. I wasn't going to say no. But at the end of that, I understood why Jesus put this in, in, in holy writ. I understood what was happening. Uh, as we were pouring out ourselves, we were emptying ourselves, Jesus fills us, fills us with his spirit, and it is the spirit of service. Do you want that spirit today? Okay, Jesus, we know this story. We'll go down to verse 11. We're just talking about elephants in the room. Here's something else that Jesus knew. For Jesus knew who should betray him. I'm going to go back to verse 10. Jesus said to Peter, he that is washed needeth not to say, needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and you are clean, but not all. He's about to talk about an elephant in the room, a young man who is so talented, so blessed. He received power from God, just like they all did, to cast out demons and do the wonderful things that he did. He was schooled. He was trained. In the eyes of humans, wow, he was quiet. He was probably the most talented and most uh, faithful disciple. But I'm here to remind us that faithfulness and uh, achievement are not the same thing. We think that achievement is faithfulness, and i got to remind us that it's not. I want to be faithful. How about you? I don't want to be great. I want to be faithful. Judas was great. But here Jesus said, is talking about the elephant in his room. John 13, 11, he says, For Jesus, for he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, ye are all not clean. After he instituted this service, Jesus goes on to tell people that if I have done this, and I meaning the creator of all, he who was in heaven receiving worship, angels bowing prostrate before him. If I have done this to you, what should you do to each other? We should wash one another's feet. I don't know that aside from the old Dutch Reformed Church and uh, Seventh-day Adventists, how many people actually even do this? You know, not a lot of people do this. And this seemed like a strange uh, teaching to some people. But I'm thankful that God sends his spirit to take away the dross of what we think is, is lowly esteemed. After he washed their feet and had taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Know ye what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I have given an example that you should do as I have done to you, not just there, but in every other thing. This whole book is a testament of his example that we should emulate. And like we were saying this morning, don't get out your checklist. Just have him inhabit you, and you'll be able to carry out those things that he wants us to do. Well, we talked about Judas. It says that the devil had convinced him to do something. A little while later, we find out that, that Satan had full access to Judas. We're going to read that, and we want to talk about that. It's an elephant in the room as well. How did he get to that point where he was allowed uh, to have Satan enter him? Don't let me leave here without talking about that for a moment. Verse 18, Jesus says, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the word, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. And those are all elephants, wherever you see that the scripture may be fulfilled. To God studying people, this is something that we should be aware of. That the scripture may be fulfilled, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, that you may believe that I am. He's, good. He's, letting, us, he's letting us know when you see this, it's for you to believe that he is. When you see pandemonium and utter ruckus in your streets, he told us this was going to happen. Not that we should be blind or impervious or... or or uh, disconnected from that. But we need to recognize that he's letting us know, wake up. 
something is happening here that I've already let you know about. It's already being portrayed in the streets and in our homes, some of us. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomever I send receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. So he says, one of you will betray me. They didn't have a clue who it was at that table, but who knew? Jesus knew. He knows who's serious. And when we come to communion, a lot of people don't even want to come to church when it's communion time. You know, sometimes that's the, 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 the least attendance out of the whole quarter is when people see that uh, communion is about to happen. I, I wonder why that is. I think it's because we may mis maybe we misunderstand what that is about. Maybe we think we're approaching the Lord unworthily. But we don't read on where it says, no, he, you're doing it dis not discerning the Lord's body. Can we take a little roll call of who was at that first uh, communion? Peter, right? Denied his Lord how many times? Took a sword and, you know, he was aiming for the head, but he caught an ear in the garden uh, when they were trying to take Jesus captive. Who else is there? You had two brothers there that wanted to incinerate people that were being unkind to them. When Jesus was going through Samaria, you remember that? So were they unworthy? He didn't tell them not to eat. He didn't tell them not to partake. And you had Judas himself who was there. Um, so I, I don't want anyone to be um, intimidated. But you have to be perfect before you take the Lord's Supper. No, this is you rededicating your life. Now, if you have tickets in your pocket tonight to something that you shouldn't be going to, if you have plans that you should not have and you take part, then you might be doing this unworthily. Judas had plans to do something after this dinner. So he wasn't discerning his Lord's body. He had something else on his mind. 21, when Jesus had thus said he was troubled in spirit and testified, said, verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked uh, one on another, doubting of whom he spake. There's an elephant in the room. They can't see it. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. This is John. Simon Peter therefore beckoned, on him, beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast said unto him, Lord, who is it? I like where the other uh, text says, one of the other gospels says, Lord, is it I? Not is it sister so-and-so, is it brother that guy, but Lord, is it me? And Judas even tried to mock it the humility, or tried to, tried to mimic that by saying, Lord, is it I? But they were serious. They really wanted to know, is it me? And we need to ask ourselves that question every day, not just today. Lord, is it me? Am I betraying you? Am I going, am I forgetting something that you ha have taught me? And I, I like what we were talking about this morning about remembering the essence and the importance of remembering. You know that there have been, there have been funeral dirges that have turned into praises because someone remembers something. Do you know the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness? Where is that from in the Bible? Lamentations chapter 3 is Jeremiah. But you know what he said before that? He is wailing and lamenting. His teeth are broken. He doesn't know why God is allowing him to go through what he's going through. But all of a sudden, there's a verse he says, This I remember, therefore I have hope. It's him remembering something. And, you know, just like repentance or any other gift that God gives us, sometimes we can't even make ourselves remember. He'll implant a memory in your head to remind you of his faithfulness. So what started out as a lamentation, him crying and almost charging God, turns into a doxology of praise just because he's able to remember something. So don't, don't forget. We have nothing to fear, right? We have nothing to fear except as we... Uh, forget how God has led us in our past history. Look at your life. Look at your life. The teachings that we came into. When we are going apart from that, the Holy Spirit, one of the works of the Holy Spirit is to remind you of that. And so you have, if you have a wayward child or someone who, who's in your family that's outside of the ark of safety, yes, we pray for them, but we know that God will bring those things back to remembrance, that they could be the fulfillment of if you teach them the right way, that when they're old, they shall not depart from it. Verse 26. Well, they're asking about it. Jesus gives them a clue. He says, it's going to be the one who dips in with me, dips the bread in, 
to sop. Verse 27, and after the sop, Satan entered into him. What? Does God just allow demons to enter us willy-nilly? What do you think was going on there? This is a process. This is a process. Hebrews 10, 26 says, for if we sin willfully after coming into the knowledge of the truth, that there remains no sacrifice for us. So that's, that sounds like something else that Jesus said. You put the two, the, two, the two of those together, you realize, okay, these are the same thing. All manner of sin and blasphemy will be forgiven except the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Everyone who is lost will have committed that sin. It's called the unpardonable sin. It's not being gay. It is not cheating on your wife. It is not lying. It is not gossiping. But it is refusing to submit to the voice of God to the point where you can no longer hear it and you cannot be saved. That's the unpardonable sin. To resist the ministry that will lead you into the conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And when you've done that, you are an empty room waiting for someone to fill it, and that is Satan. So it says, Satan entered him. And after the sop, Satan entered into Judas, verse 27, and Jesus said unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. I'm going down to verse 30. He then, having received the sop, Judas, he went out and it was night. He went out in the darkness. Then we have this new commandment, the, the ev evidence of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Not that we can check it off. I fed the homeless. I did this that week. Here I did this. Look how much I returned in my tithe and offering. All those are good. We should do those and not leave the other undone. What is the other? Verse 35, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. I love y'all. Y'all love me. I appreciate the gifts. That was beautiful. That is wonderful. But there are some things that are coming down the pike that are going to, that's going to challenge that love. We need the love of God. We need agape love, something that could fight through loneliness and hunger and delay. And we need to be begging God for that now, corporately and individually in our closets. We're going to wrap this up. Verse 36, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, where, the, where are you going? Whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, you cannot follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, <laughs> Boy, the things that we can't see. Peter said unto him, Lord, why can I not follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Will thou lay down thy life for me? For my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Jesus knew that. Peter didn't know that. He thought he was ready. He had the training. He had been walking with him for three years. He felt like he was ready. And we may feel like we're ready in a, in a climate-controlled sanctuary. But when we go out there and the, the, the rubber meets the road or when it hits the fan, are we really ready? For a trial does not build character, but what does it do? It reveals it. Think about those words of Jesus Christ to Peter. You're going to deny me three times. You are not ready to go. I have to do something in you first. Look at it. If you flip over to John 14, there was no divisions in Scripture. There's no chapters. He's talking to the same people that he was talking to before. He just told Peter, you're going to deny me three times. So you would think, wow, is it over for Peter? Is it over for him? Look at the encouragement that Jesus gives us. If you feel like maybe you have some Peter in you, and we all do, look at the encouragement. Look at the next words. It's to the person that he just told, you're going to deny me three times. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, Peter, for you living faith. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Are you thankful to serve a God like this? Someone who knows our deepest, darkest secrets, the ugliness that we hide from ourselves, 
He knows it, but he still offers his kingdom to us. Just contingent on our acceptance of him and the work that he wants to do on, for us. Who could deny that? Who could deny him? If you look at him, he is impossible to resist. I'm thankful that he's in my life. How, how do you feel about him being in yours? But what about the people around us who don't know this peace, who don't have it? They don't know what's happening to them. We need to have that heart to not cross over the, the other side, to not be so worried about religiosity, but having a true and living uninterrupted communion with Jesus Christ. Or else this, what we're about to do, is just a show. You know that, right? If we can go through this, you know, the table is white, the purity of Christ, the bread is the body of Christ that was broken, that we might be one. How dare we be in disagreement and disunity, right? The wine represents his precious blood, his precious blood that was spilled and is being applied for us now in the heavenly sanctuary, that it could not just be covered but blotted out as if it never was. I'm thankful for that crimson flow. What about you? But if we approach this just as something to do, an exercise, I don't want this to be an exercise in futility. I don't want it to be something that we just do and check off our list. So let us pray as we dismiss for the ordinance of humility that we might have true humility. Amen? To be able to see and appreciate the awesome uh, work that God has prepared for us in the rest of that meal. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you've given us an example in your son. Where the old man of self and pride tries to rise up in each one of us, that he could be beaten back only by, only by us surrendering to you. We thank you for the peace that comes. And for the word that you speak to us, you know our hearts. You know who we are allowing to, to take reign and rule on the throne of our hearts, Lord. If it's us, it's someone else, it's Satan. But if we get out of the way and allow you to operate in our lives, we know that we can expect blessing. We can expect peace. And we can expect to be used by you to reach others. We thank you so much for your son. We thank you so much for his work in our hearts. And as we contemplate our need for him and our need to decrease that he might increase, help us to be willing to lay it down. And we exercise this in the foot washing. The ordinance of humility, Lord, humble us. We're trying to humble ourselves, Lord. We thank you that you don't embarrass us by humbling us. You give us a chance to humble ourselves. And, Lord, we take on the position of a servant because we know what you have for us in the life to come and even the blessings that we enjoy in this one. Be with us and watch over this, and we're thankful that you're here. Not in, not in the emblems, but you're here in spirit. And we thank you that you are here, Lord, and we want to acknowledge your presence by our faithfulness and how we carry out this service. Bless us to this end, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.